Um, okay, I think recording's in progress. Um, so I'm going to um, share a screen in a moment. Um, and what I just want to do today is just to share a little bit about earlier work that I'm bringing to this, you know, where I'm coming from in terms of my practice, so that you can see a little bit of my process. And also just to talk a little bit about some of the aspects of these incredible manuscripts and what's going on now around them and how, how they seem to me um, and how excited I am to find how much they connect to the landscape of Cornwall here. But before I share my screen, I thought I'd just share my studio with you. I'm in my studio in St. Ives. I'm gonna pick my screen up and make you all feel sick. So there is, um, I don't know if you can see out of my window there, there's the beach um, at Portsmere in August, which is of course incredibly busy. So I'm in St. Ives now, very close to Redruth. Um, and um, I'm going to just share my screen now. I hope this is, um, working and then I'm going to go um, and put it on the correct kind of view so can I have a thumbs up Amanda if that's working okay <laughs> thank you just to say um, so this is an earlier work of mine but just to say um, I'm going to ask Amanda to put a few links in the chat as we go so that you can um, uh, you know just to share a little bit more for other links you can go to so I'll just begin with this piece. This piece is called Toll, um, and it's a piece I made back in 2014. And for those of you who are very familiar with Cornwall, you'll recognize um, some of these images. Uh, it's a steel structure holding glass. And this is a kind of way of making a, a collage, like a three-dimensional collage here, because this is a kind of folded work, it freestands. Um, to bring images together um, in space. So this form that you can see um, is taken from uh, a print by Barbara Hepworth called Itea, which was made in the 70s. And it's a line drawing, Itea is just a line drawing. And I've used that form when I looked at her, her um, when I was looking at the, um, uh, I think it's a, is it an etching? I can't remember. As I was looking at it, I realized that if I could take the paper out of its frame and fold it up, it would freestand as if it was a plan for a sculpture. So that's what I've done here. And then, so, so for me, there are different um, voices of creative women actually um, brought together in this work. There's Barbara Hepworth and the, the structure is hers. Right? Um, and then the second person is you can see Gudrivi Lighthouse there. Gudrivi is the lighthouse into the lighthouse by Virginia Woolf. We, she set the novel in Scotland, but it's widely known that her family holidayed in Carbis Bay and they would be looking straight out towards Gudrivi. So this form of Gudrivi there is for me recalling Virginia Woolf and her thoughts about the landscape and how her views have influenced my views over the years. The way that I understand um, the world around me is influenced by her as all great writers influence, um, all great artists influence the way that you look. Then there's, um, I just have a question uh, for somebody. There's a lot of screaming going on on the beach from people getting in the sea. Is it too loud? No, okay. <laughs> I could shut the window. I'm gonna hear all this screaming. It's a cold sea. Um, uh, sorry, oh, um, then you can see this form of the Menentol. So Menentol is probably Cornwall's best known um, Neolithic uh, monument. And it's, uh, it takes the form of a hold stone, which is what Menentol means. And it has standing stones around it. It has two stones, one either side of it. And this photograph is from the 70s and it shows the light coming through um, that circular stone. Um, then, I just uh, can't remember how to do this. Here's a bit of a close up, and here again is um, Gudrivi. And the form of Gudrivi of this circular fence, this circular wall with this upright is very much like the circle with the upright here, and it's a form you see very often. This part of the structure is um, has two images. They're both from a book by Daphne du Maurier, and some of Daphne du Maurier's text have left printed here. So the third person then, um, is Daphne du Maurier, a writer who very much um, embraced Cornwall and wrote about it passionately, and again, whose um, vision of Cornwall is impacted on mine. 
um, so there's a little close up of the, um, the, what I've done in the sculpture is take one image and then reverse out the other. So you get this kind of um, doubling, which gives it a kind of more uh, un unreal kind of less physical quality. Um, so that's just one um, sculpture um, that I, I, I made a number of years ago that I'm aware is um, thinking about the place that I live in. So all of those pieces, so I'm just gonna return to the main image because it's easy. Oh, oh, I'm going the wrong way. Oh no, this is a nightmare. <laughs> Sorry, hang on. Going back again, that wasn't very good. Um, this one um, is um, my journey from St. Just. So I live in St. Just where the Ordinalia are happening. Right now there's a frenzy of rehearsals going on because the Ordinalia, the Cornish Miracle plays are being performed in St. Just in early September. So anybody who's close enough to get a ticket to come along to that, it will be an extraordinary thing. One thing I really want to say about it is that it, um, it's being performed in the original place that was intended to be performed, which is quite a special thing. So I live in St. Just and on my way to my studio in St. Ives, I pass the Menentol, I come over and I see um, Gudrivi Lighthouse in front of me. So this is a, my reflection in a way on what it means for me to be here now and have an awareness of all of these other voices, all of these other narratives and stories of the place that is my home. So this really affected my approach to the commission. Um, the commission um, piece that I'm proposing has a title, it's Trey, which um, means um, a home in Cornish or return back. Um, but it has this overtone of the English word tree, which I really welcome, which I'll come on to later. Here's a piece, um, a small piece just made with uh, open books and book plates. This one is um, called The Maidens. This is uh, one view of it. Um, of this little sculpture. And you'll see here an image of the Merry Maidens near Penzance in a, a book called The Story of Cornwall. Um, and propped open is another book. And the page that that is open at shows Morris dancers. And I've brought another image to it, which is um, a group of women at Greenham Common Women's uh, Peace Camp. Um, and this is an action called Embrace the Base where this enormous nuclear uh, base at Greenham was completely encircled by hundreds and hundreds of women um, on the day in 1987. Um, and so by bringing this circle of women, these, this, these transgressive women, these women who left their homes and their families in order to be on that sort of hard line of protest and lived at Greenham for years and years, um, gave up their lives for it, these line of transgressive women for me related very much to the story of um, the Merry Maidens, which are a circle of transgressive women who were turned to stone as a punishment for dancing on the Sabbath. That is the Christian story um, about these, these stone circles. Um, there's another one called the Nine Maidens. So this sort of um, petrification of these women, and this stone circle is still, it's not far from here, it's over towards Sancreed, um, you know, just a little bit west of where I'm sitting now, um, seemed to me very much to connect to this more contemporary image of a line of transgressive women, a circle of transgressive women in the landscape. So again, here I'm, I'm bringing together the, the kind of old stories that make it closer to our time and make these connections through time. So um, from those two works, um, The Maidens and Toll, let's turn to thinking about the, um, the fabric of Crescent Kerno. So Crescent Kerno, this new archive for Cornwall built in an old brewery in Red Roof. Um, here you can see a window um, that was been placed sort of projecting out from the stones of the brewery. Um, and this is the side that I've chosen to uh, make a work that will, will be inside of this window. And um, I'm just gonna move forward to some of my um, research or in research towards what, what would be appropriate for this window, how we might think about it. I was very aware of the manuscripts um, that are coming back. This is a little quote from a book by Brian Murdoch called Legends of the Holy Rood in Cornish Drama. And Brian Murdoch's research um, has 
really, uh, really sort of struck me as so interesting for now. So this is just a little um, text from Brian's book, um, and I'll just read it out. Um, the widespread and complex narrative of the Holy Rood traces the history of the cross from its beginnings as three seeds or twigs from the tree of life fetched from paradise after a quest for the promised oil of mercy by Seth, who makes his way there by following the pathway of withered grass that marked the passage of Adam and Eve after the expulsion. Seth is allowed to look into paradise and sees the child who will be the savior at the top of a barren tree. The seeds or twigs given him instead of the oil of mercy are placed into the mouth of his dead father and these grow and merge into the tree that will provide the wood of the cross. The legend traces the fate of the tree from Moses to David and most notably to Solomon, who tries in vain to incorporate the tree into his temple. So he says the motive of the tree growing from Adam's mouth is, a well, is well developed iconographically and Adam's skull is linked with the place of the crucifixion, Golgotha. Adam's skull is frequently placed at the foot of the cross in art and the blood from Christ's feet sometimes flows into the mouth of the skull as a Eucharistic symbol. So Brian Murdoch's um, research on medieval manuscripts makes him very aware of how, although um, the Ordinalia, that manuscript of these three plays, Origo Mundi, the origins of the world, the passion and the resurrection, they, they tell the biblical story, but because for the medieval period, and this was something brought out very much in Michelle Brown's talk that is an earlier part of the series that I'm speaking in now, everything for them was multivalent and also um, like crisscross through with different significances. Um, and also they didn't, the, in the medieval period, the Bible stories were very open and many stories were brought together, um, which we would now call apocrypha. So legend was mixed up with uh, the biblical stories that might, we might be more familiar with. And a figure like Seth, um, figures quite um, importantly or very importantly in the story as it's told in Origo Mundi. Um, this I'm showing you now is a little close-up of um, a detail, close-up of uh, one of the manuscripts that's going to be at Crescent Kerno um, later this year. Um, it is Pascan Ugan Arleth and it's sometimes called Mount Calvary and it's a, po a passion poem and it's illustrated. And so um, I just wanted to bring this up so here you can see Eve and the tree of knowledge with the serpent. And you'll see that the tree here has three, um, three branches. Um, the serpent is twisting around it rather like um, uh, the, the symbol that Hermes uses. And we see Eve twice. We see her approaching the tree from the right. And on the left, you see her with the apple. And here is a little section from um, Pascan Agan Arleth, and this is from um, Halliday's The Legend of the Root. Um, its most moving passage, the most moving passage, he says, is that of the making of the cross with its antithetic conceit that there might be born a fruit to save us, surely on the tree, whence came a fruit by which we were lost. Um, and the Ordinalia text and Pascan Agan Arleth are very close. Um, they a drawing very much on the same, they're, they're obviously aware of the same sources, which is something that I understood from Brian Murdoch's um, research. Um, so this idea that the tree is, um, at, is, is the, the fruit of knowledge and therefore the fall, and exactly the same tree goes full circle and becomes the tree of our salvation, the tree that Christ crucified upon in order to save us. So what interested me about that um, and what makes the Ordinalia, the Cornish Ordinalia, very different from the, um, the English mystery plays that I read when I was at university, um, is this insistence on the presence of the tree. So I'm showing you now um, a small um, painting by um, Bertolt Furtmeyer. Um, it's dated 1482. And you can see um, the tree of knowledge with the... Um, with the serpent and the apple, very similarly to the we saw in Pascan Agan Aleph, being taken by Eve, the, the apples being taken by Eve. But on the other side of the tree stands the Virgin Mary, also um, taking from the tree. And in the tree, you can see Christ on the cross. So Christ, not as a child, but um, crucified on the cross. And you can see the skull there as well. So this a uh, little painting from 1482, which is contemporary with the Ordinalia, um, 
is uh, really just making that point that the same tree goes through the entire story, which really um, struck me as a, a sort of nature conceit that I can really pick up on now. Um, I'm showing you now um, a parallel translation by Agantavas of Origo Mundi, and I've marked up there in yellow, a part of the story that really struck me. So just to follow a little bit, so um, follow the parched prince of my feet is saying Adam to his son Seth, no grass or flower, whatever grow in that same way where that I walked. Um, and so Seth, the son of Adam, the third son of Adam after Cain and Abel, he follows this um, withered um, grass, the, this brown dead grass back to actually get to the gates of Eden, which is an incredible idea of homecoming already, um, because you know, according to the biblical story, Eden is our home and we're barred from it. But Seth goes back and he isn't able to enter, but he's allowed by the cherubim to look through the door. And he says, reading again from this parallel translation, what a lovely sight this is. Woe is he who lost the land. But to me, it is very astonishing that the tree is dried up. But I believe it is dry and made completely bare for the sin which my father and mother sinned, like the tracks of their, their feet, Dry are they all like mud? When I read this, I was really struck by this, this moment here. Um, I can't read in Cornish, but um, this part here where the tree is dry because there is a stone in Cornwall called Dry Tree, which is this one. It's at Goonhilly on the Lizard, and it's the um, end of a sacred way that ran from pretty much from Mullion. And it's a parallel ceremonial way that cuts through a number of miles inland from the coast. And I've walked that myself um, several times. Once I did it at night as an artwork. Um, Amanda, I should have said earlier, you could have put up the link to the, um, sorry, the um, uh, little video about, tells you more about Tolk, but I, I forgot. So you could put that up now if anybody wants to read more about that. But going back to this stone, not the, um, the Menantol stone that you see on Toll. So this stone is called Dry Tree. And I always thought it was a strange name for this huge standing stone. The stone that you're looking at now is much smaller than it once was. It was broken up. It was being broken up as many huge stones, ancient Neolithic stones were broken up in Cornwall um, over centuries to be just used as gateposts quite often. And this one was being broken up by soldiers and they were stopped by, um, um, the Vivian family at Trella Warren. Um, and you can see in the background this satellite station because this satellite dish, because Goonhilly, from being this kind of powerful site in um, Neolithic times and having dry tree marking that power, it's also a, a site where we project up to the heavens because it's now got the Goonhilly uh, Earth satellite station there. So then it, uh, when I was reading this, here's another translation by um, Alan Kent from the Ordinalia. Oh God, this is a wonderful sight. Much woe to him who lost these fine lands. This is the same as the translation we read before. But look, it's given me a fair fright to see the tree dry, parched as it stands. So then I started to think about these stories of the merry maidens dancing and how they were petrified. And I started to think about Cornish stories about stones and Cornish stories about trees and the tree of knowledge and how perhaps here the medieval um, writer or these writers um, in the medieval period, looking at all of these stones that still surround us now, they're all still here, um, scattered about in West Penwith, where I live very heavily, um, how they incorporate them, I think, into this medieval mystery play, um, using that theme of the tree and linking it here, to, for me at least, to these standing stones, these ancient stones that had such meaning and power. Um, before the medieval period and still into the medieval period, just as stories were changed. So thinking about um, Cornwall and how we all share this place, everybody has their own story about it. And these stories are told and retold and they change over time and they, they build on each other and they blend. And that's something that I find deeply interesting. So just to go back to um, the story then um, in the parallel translation, um, Seth says, Angel of gracious God, in the tree I saw high up on a branch a little newly born child that was wrapped in clouts and bound fast with a swaddling band. And the angel says to him, he is the oil of mercy which was promised to your father, Adam. 
Um, and the cherub says, take three pips of the apple, which Adam, thy father, did eat. And when he dies, put them without fail between his teeth and his tongue. From them thou wilt see three trees spring up present, pre presently, for he will not live more than three days after thou hast gone home. So Seth is told to take these pips from the original apple that Eve tasted and to put them in his dead father's mouth, which is such a strange non-biblical um, image. Um, and we can see it on this um, medieval stained glass. So this is a pane of glass from St Neot, which is near Los Withiel, a little bit further um, east in Cornwall, sort of on the way to Plymouth, if you live where I do. Um, and St Neot Church still has its original uh, medieval windows. And it's something that's easy to forget in Cornwall. Not only are we surrounded by these incredible Neolithic stones, um, and they are have been altered, many of them, and they've but they've stood the test of time. And this medieval glass is still here in Cornwall, just in the church windows. You can go in and see it any time. And in this window, you can see Seth here placing the seeds, uh, the three seeds in dead Adam's mouth, and Adam is lying in bed with a sort of medieval canopy over him, and behind Seth you can see the oil of mercy or the Christ child hanging in the tree. So this kind of, um, uh, this was a very significant um, thought at the time that the plays were written. And it turns up also in, for example, this, um, the legendary history of the cross, which is also 1480s. And you can see here, Seth buries Adam and puts the three seeds of the tree of life under his tongue, which is kind of a macabre, um, image, but for me, it also connects to um, stories of the, the green man, the pagan green man who has a tree sprouting from his mouth. Um, and I'll just show you one more little um, image from Pascan Agan Aleph. It's a little leaf which is drawn at the bottom of uh, one of the pages. And I, oh, it's a feather, but I feel like it's a leaf floating down from the tree of knowledge sort of through this story. Um, and it really struck me. Um, this, this connection through, through this continual cycle of the tree at the beginning and all the way around to the end and how these trees for us in Cornwall and for the medieval um, playwright who wrote Origo Mundi um, connected with Glasney and Penryn um, just on the south coast of Cornwall, how the, the stones connect to this, this tree symbol and then connect through to all sorts of other myths and stories about the landscape that, that have, have um, appeared through time. So having had the, uh, a pretty quick gallop through some of the extraordinary details in these manuscripts um, and how they may connect to the land, um, I'll go back to thinking about glass. So we've seen here St. Neot. Um, here we have um, a silver stain and colored glass um, leaded into a panel in a traditional way. And here's a piece um, I've made quite recently. This is just um, a photograph that's taken in the corner of my studio. Uh, it's a piece I've called Cleopatra. And here you can see um, similar technique. So I've got colored and tinted glass um, leaded together and held onto a steel framework. Um, and here I'm thinking about books being passed through hands. So I'm thinking about uh, um, how knowledge and ideas circulated and transformed as they're passed down through time, as they're passed from hand to hand here. Um, instead of, um, and here it is um, looking like you know, I'm sitting next to this spot. So here it is against the light. And you'll see um, glass has this beautiful feature of being both inside and outside a building when you place it in the window. So you not only see it from inside where it's uh, the daylight pours through it and what you see beyond is changed rather like um, the way I was saying that my view of Cornwall is fundamentally changed by having read Virginia Woolf, having read Daphne du Maurier. So what the, the sea that you can see through it here is distorted and changed the colors and it's broken up. And um, at nighttime, if it's in the window, it, the lights, the, the colors and the shapes pour out of the building, um, you know, beyond into, so you can see them from outside. And so I really wanted to create a piece of 
work for Crescent Kerner that would make sense when you were inside the building, but would also beam out beyond the building at night and that where it can be lit. Here's a little detail. Um, I'm not painting on glass, which would be the technique used by medieval um, stained glass makers. Um, this piece differs in two ways significantly from a medieval stained glass panel. Firstly, it is not complete because I'm not proposing to make a window which also has to keep out the weather. It can be open work, so parts can be glazed and parts can be left free. And the second thing that is very different is I'm using screen print, which is a sort of um, 20th century contemporary way of printing photographically. So I can take photographs and screen print them using an enamel. Here I'm using a very opaque black enamel and then um, that is fired on and the enamel becomes part of that glass and is completely irremovable. So this is just um, sharing with you a few of the kind of techniques and ideas about um, um, gesturing towards these incredible stories that are recorded in medieval glass here in Cornwall, but doing them in a way which is much closer to the 20, you know, 21st century where we are now. So there's something else that the window will contain, which is important to tell you about, um, which is some of the glass, um, most of the glass will be um, glass that I will buy in sheet form. What you can see at the bottom, that's a glass called English Muffle, and there's Wispy, and there's Lambert's glass, mouth blown glass. But this is a piece of glass that is very different. This is a piece of glass which I made myself using beach sand and seaweed. So I discovered, this is a long story, and again, if um, Amanda would be so kind as to put a link into the um, chat, you can see a small film about how it, the making of this glass. The film is called Flux. It's 12, 12 and a half minutes long. Um, because what we're looking at now is we're looking at a piece of glass that is like a lens onto the beach, but the sand that it's made of is the sand of that beach, is the beach outside my window, it's Porthmere. Um, and the flux, which is the, it's, uh, the agent that you add to the sand in order to bring down the melting point of the sand so it can be melted and become a sheet of glass, molten glass, that um, is seaweed. And so I discovered when I was on Scilly, the Scilly Isles are about 24 miles out to sea from St. Just, and they still have kelp pits because from 1600, so not quite the medieval period, but not so long after, for about 200 years, there was an industry, a cottage industry on Scilly um, to burn kelp or burn seaweed to ash. And the ash was sent to Bristol to use by, in the glass industry. And I was completely amazed when I realized that you could, it was therefore possible to take a single beach and without really adding anything, you could make glass. So when I was invited to um, you know, go forward um, and create a piece for Crescent Kono, I thought it would be really beautiful to have the glass, this glass roundels in the window like this one, um, although it'd be different to this as you'll see, um, that actually not only do you look at the landscape through the glass, but the glass is the landscape. It actually just is a piece of Cornwall right there. So um, if you'd like to hear more about that, you could um, watch that more on my website, which you can find abigailreynolds.com. So um, I don't want to take too much more time. So I'm just going to run through looking at this. This is a roundel, or it's called also plate. And it's made by blowing a bubble, which is spun, and it flares out and becomes a circular piece and um, you see the center that's called a bullion or a bullseye that's where the pontil was removed and that would be the glass you wouldn't want you'd want the pieces that you would cut from the outside it's a very beautiful thin glass but looking at it here we have a circle that's made by gravity and breath um, the next slide shows you the um, plan for the ordinalia so the ordinalia were performed i'll just show you it being performed in the plen in st just um, I think this is from 2004. The plane in St. Just, or sorry, the plane, I keep calling it the plane, but that's not right. The plane in St. Just, the plane in Gwari, 
the medieval playing place is circular. And you can see here, there are mansions around the outside and a stage in the center. And the stories are played out across this circle according to this um, plan, which is in the manuscript at the front, it's drawn at the front of the manuscript. And there were planes all across Cornwall as Will Coleman really beautifully described in the talk which you can still, I believe, see on the Crescent Kono website, also part of this series. And from his talk, I understood that it should be this way up. So I've rotated this from a book because hell should be in the north and we draw our maps with north as up. So I thought, well, I'd better redraw it. Hell is in the north, heaven is in the east. Um, and it, the entire story is played out within this circle. So um, from this circle to this circle and talking again about other circles that I've um, used in my work before, like the Merry Maidens that we saw being used in that work, the Maidens, at the beginning of this talk. Um, here is, um, um, this image is just from the Crescent Kono archive, because of course Crescent Kono has a very rich um, repository of images that can be, um, can be seen. This is a glass negative showing um, the hurlers, where there are several stone circles all placed together. Um, so from this circle, going back to think about the plains and these circles all over Cornwall. Um, so I feel like the circle, the circle of the, um, the tree uh, returning through the cycle, the circle of the plain and guaris, the circles of the stones, this might become something that's important for the work that I make um, called Trey for Crescent Kerno. Um, I'll just say something a little bit, there's gonna be um, opportunities to engage um, um, with, the, with the process a little bit um, as, as we go forward. So watch out on the, on the Crescent Kerno website for those. But one uh, thing I wanted to mention is um, the piece will be uh, unveiled. Uh, I will have finished it by St. Piran's Day next year, St. Piran's Day being the 5th of March, St. Piran being the um, Cornish Saint. Um, so it's a very appropriate day to launch. And on that day, I'm going to ask um, Richard Ovenden, who is um, the uh, Bodley's librarian. Um, so he's head of the Bodleian Library, who are lending some of those manuscripts. He's going to lead a walk along this path, this historic road, which links pretty much exactly links Glasney in Penryn here with Crescent Kerno because it seems to me quite incredibly like beautiful that you can just walk between those sites. So once there was Glasney, and if you want to learn more about that, I believe there's also a talk on the Crescent Kerno website that specifically talks about Glasney. Glasney was a college and when it was destroyed in the Reformation or by Henry VIII, that was pretty much, um, you know, all the Cornish manuscripts were dispersed and lost and the Cornish language suffered an incredible blow from that loss of that site. But now we have a new uh, Cornish um, archive. We have a new place where information and knowledge about Cornwall can be gathered together in one place, which is Crescent Kerno. And it's probably only a three hour walk. So I've asked Richard Ovenden who wrote a beautiful book um, called Burning the Books. It came out in 2020, um, which is about lost libraries, about these um, deliberately destroyed, um, repositories of books, right? why they were destroyed. So it'll be fascinating to hear what he has to say on this walk. And I'm gonna end with an image of uh, one more um, circle because on the way we will go through Gwenap Pit. Gwenap Pit is not a plain and quarry. It's not a playing place. It's, um, it was, uh, it's a mining um, pit really that's, that was reconfigured so that John Wesley could preach from it. So all of these um, banked, um, seating going down into this former mine working would have been, um, people would have sat around them. And I just feel looking at this fairly recent, um, if you're talking about, you know, the Nine Maidens and uh, other circles and the Plain and Guaris, this fairly recent amphitheatre um, type, well, it's not an amphitheatre, this, this circular form for bringing people together to all witness or share in some um, experience and this permanence of it on the landscape, that it's set into the landscape and it remains there. I'm sure they were very aware of the Plain and Guaris when they made this more recent form. So um, yeah, I, I'm going to stop sharing my screen at that point. And um, 
uh, now I'm a bit lost. Um, You're going to hand over to me. <laughs> Thank you, Chloe. Um, and just to say, there's one more link, I think, because I'm also giving a talk at Porthmere where I'll be showing some of the glass in a new work in the studio window here. And so there's a link to that if you want to come along. So thank you. Um, I think we've got some time for questions, have we, Chloe? Uh, yeah, and thank you very much for that um, talk. I'm just gonna wait. I think Amanda's gonna stop recording. So if anyone's got any questions uh, for Abigail, it's really fascinating and great to hear how all those